Thanks, Noel. Uh, hi, everybody. Really great to be here. Um, before I start, I just want to say what a fantastic WordCamp it's been so far. Um, and I'm hoping that Kareem, who's up next, uh, and I can kind of finish things off in style for everybody. Um, so I've been lucky enough to, to attend quite a few WordCamps, um, I guess all over the world, um, including all three of these pan-European events. Um, and for me, WordCamp Europe really represents the very best of what we can achieve as a community. Um, and I just think it's a fantastic showcase uh, for, for, for the European WordPress community. Um, and I kind of feel hugely privileged to be up here talking to you all, so thanks for having me. So over the years, I've, I've talked to a lot of people about remote working, and I've thought a lot about the why of the distributed model. Why are we distributed? Why be distributed? What are the reasons why behind it, or behind why it works? And something I hear time and time again is that it's really all about hiring. That the, the key benefit being that you're not limited to hiring people who just happen to live near you, um, and you kind of have access to this larger talent pool, um, and you can hire people that your non-distributed competitors can't. Um, and just maybe, if you happen to live in London or, or in San Francisco, or one of the many other expensive cities around the world, you can save some money on salaries and on the office as well. And the bit about saving money, kind of not so true. You should pay people well no matter where they live. And any money you do save on an office, you're going to more than spend on travel. But it is obviously really great for hiring. The best people are everywhere. And if you've embraced remote work, you can hire them. It's simple. But to me, it's always felt that by just focusing on those hiring benefits, we're really missing something. What happens after we've hired these people? How do we keep them happy? How do we enable them to do the great work that we need them to do? And as, as kind of a human made has grown, I've started to get a sense of what I think are the real strengths that underlie the distributed model. And to me, it's part of this larger conversation about people. And it's a bet on an intuition I think a lot of us probably share, that people want to do great work, and that too often it's kind of us, the companies, that get in their way. So I believe that by embracing the values that underpin the distributed model, we can fix that. And instead, we can build companies that enable and support people to do the great work that they want to do. First, a bit of context. As Noel mentioned, I'm Tom. I co-founded and I'm the CEO at Human Made. Um, and we're like a technology company. We do client services, mostly WordPress development and consulting for enterprise clients. And we have some products as well, Happy Tables, WP Remote, and some others. And we're pretty distributed. Contrast not great there. But that's a map of the world. And, and we've currently got about 28 humans uh, spread across 22 cities. Turns out that's not actually that simple to calculate, as when people can work from anywhere, they tend to move around. But what's true is that every day we're working with people across multiple time zones, multiple locations. And our clients are also distributed. Some share cities, try repeating that quickly, with a human. Some don't. But we're nearly always working with them remotely often using the same tools and processes that we use to communicate with each other. And lastly, our products have users spread right around the world. Kind of amazing, really. Last I checked, the kind of hundreds of thousands of users that our products have were, were based in over 4,000 towns and cities worldwide. Now, I like to say um, that like one of my heroes, Doctor Who, everything we do is distributed across time and space. <laughs> OK, enough context. Let's get to the detail. Why is remote working better? Why is the distributed model a better model for people and for business? Now, we already know that dis being distributed helps with hiring. But hiring people is only the first step. Once you've hired, how do you make sure those people are happy over the long term? And how do you enable them to do great work? Let's talk about motivation. I 
too often the systems we set up to manage people and to manage the work that they're doing align really poorly with what motivates those very same people to do great work. And I think a lot of us mostly know this in our hearts. We do our best work out of work. And I've experienced this pretty strongly in a previous career. I worked in a school, and we had strong rules and processes that described the job we were supposed to do. And every single person in that school, including all the kids, knew that those rules were mostly stupid. They were incomplete, they were imperfect. And so we learned how to dodge them, how to bend them, how to do the good work that needed doing, despite those very same rules and processes that were in place. And even though we all knew what needed to be done and how to do it, we weren't trusted to do it. We weren't trusted. And over time, that's pretty demotivating. And it's really why I and a lot of the other people who worked there only stayed for a couple of years. So generally, these systems rely on the motivational effect of a promised reward or punishment based on whether you're correctly following the rules and processes that describe your job. They're what science call extrinsic motivators. Remember that. It's going to be important later. Here's how I want you to work. Do that well, and you'll get a bonus, maybe some commission, a promotion. Do it poorly, you'll get a warning, maybe a performance improvement plan. I don't think these systems work very well, especially not when it comes to the creative work a lot of us are doing. And it turns out it's not just an intuition, it's science. And here's what it tells us. Once a reasonable standard of living is achieved, reward and punishment not only fail to motivate people to do more, better, or faster, they actually demotivate people. And this is especially true in creative roles. That is, tasks where working out the solution rather than just applying a solution that you've been given is a key part of the job. So let's look at a study. This one by Sam Glucksberg. Here, two groups, each presented with the candle problem. Individually, each person in the group goes into a room, and using only the things you can see here, they have to light the candle and fix it to the wall in such a way that wax won't drip on the floor. It's a fundamentally creative task. Some of you might be aware of it. The solution requires creative thinking. You have to see the box that the tax come in as something that you can use to solve the task rather than just part of the, of the furniture. So we had two groups in this, in this study. The first one were told that they were being timed to establish average completion times. And the second group were given incentives. They were told that if they complete the task within the top 20% on the day, they'll get $5. Pretty nice amount of money for a couple of minutes' work. And this was 1962, after all. So generally, this kind of thing takes like 10 or 15 minutes. So how much faster do you think that incentivized group completed it? And this is where it gets pretty interesting, because they actually finished it, on average, three and a half minutes slower than the group that weren't incentivized. I think you have to have this slide in every talk these days after that great JavaScript one. So this one's mine. So what's going on here? That's crazy. We're all used to thinking that if you want people to work better, you reward them. You give them bonuses, commissions, promotions. But that's not what this is showing. In fact, the opposite happened. What it's showing is that extrinsic motivators, reward and punishment, at best don't work as a motivator for creative tasks. And at worst, can actually have a negative effect on performance. Let's look at another study. In this one by Dan Aureli, participants were given a set of creative games to play. One of the groups was again incentivized, but this time, the, this time the rewards were graded. So do the best, and you'll get a large reward. Do pretty well, you'll get a medium reward. Do OK, you'll get a small reward. I wonder what happened here. So it's even worse than we thought. 
Not only can rewards have a negative effect on performance, but the larger the reward, the larger the negative effect. Crazy. Okay. So trying to motivate people to complete creative tasks using reward and punishment doesn't work. But what does? And luckily, science has the answers here too. And it's all about intrinsic motivators. Our innate desire to do things that matter because we like them, because they're interesting, and because they're part of something important. In fact, we can think about it as boiling down to these three things. We have purpose, our yearning to do things that matter. We have mastery, our desire to get better at those things and eventually master them. And autonomy, the urge we all share to direct our own lives. I'm pretty sure on time, so I'm only going to talk about autonomy, but it's worth saying that as a community, we're not sure on purpose or opportunities for mastery either. We have this amazing mission, and we have the opportunity to make a real impact on the world. And we're all part of this incredible, inspiring community. So it's through this modern, science-based understanding of motivation that we can really start to discover the benefits inherent in the distributed model. I believe that the distributed model, as a system for organizing people and work, more, much more closely aligns with how science tells us motivation actually works. And I believe that distributed teams will naturally be more motivated because autonomy and self-direction are inherent to the model. Let's dig a little bit deeper. So autonomy as a motivator really gets to the heart of the strengths of the distributed model. If you want compliance, then you need management. But self-direction and autonomy is always better if you want creativity and engagement. If you've hired people who know how to do good work, then giving them autonomy over how they do that work is a powerful motivator. And optimizing for remote work naturally leads to an organization that promotes autonomy and self-direction for the simple reason that it's almost impossible to monitor the details of how people are working if you're asleep and thousands of miles away. So it's kind of obvious, but it really starts with having autonomy over where you live and work. If you work best at home, work there. Work best in a coffee shop in town, work there. Work best in an office surrounded by people, join a co-working space. The intrinsic motivation that comes from being able to work where you ch you've chosen to live your life is huge. Next comes autonomy over when you work. When you're spread across time zones, it makes no sense to require people to work set hours of the day. Time zones mean you can't all be online working at the same time anyway. So autonomy over when you work is the only logical conclusion. And the intrinsic motivation that comes from being able to work at times that best suit your life is huge. Lastly comes autonomy over the technique of your work. If I'm not able to be when and where you are working, it's not effective for me to dictate how you do that. Autonomy over how you do your work is the only logical option. And the intrinsic motivation that comes from being able to work in ways which you know are best is huge. And if we aren't tracking when, where, and how work is being done, the only thing left to track is the results of that work, the output. And it turns out that that's all that actually matters anyway. And in fact, there's a name for this. It's called a results-only work environment. It was invented by some management consultant somewhere, I'm sure. And organizations that follow it don't track when, where, and how work is being done. They just track the quality of that work. And in general, those organizations see productivity go up, and they see engagement go up, and they see staff turnover go down. And another really important aspect to this 
is by tracking output, you remove the natural biases that you have against people who do things differently to you. So just because you're a morning person doesn't mean that getting into the office early is the best thing for everybody. And it certainly doesn't mean that those that arrive at 11 or 1 or 3 are lazy. Maybe they perform better working late. And if great work's getting done and the team are happy, who cares what people's sleeping patterns are? So let's sum up. In creative roles, people are motivated by mastery, by purpose, and by autonomy. Not by the promise of a bit more money or the threat of getting in trouble. The distributed model and the open source community we all inhabit strongly promote those very same intrinsic motivators. And a culture which fully embraces the distributed model and the values we all inherit from open source will be more productive, more engaged, and ultimately happier. Thanks very much for listening. So hi, hey. Hugo, by the way, uh, from Portugal. Um, how do you manage to, so you, you talk about the relationship with your uh, employees, let's call it like that. Uh, what about your clients? Uh, do you have a person who manage uh, client communication and then distribute it uh, through the team? Uh, and it's kind of responsible to take care of the client and keep him, keep him happy also? Or how does it work? Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess each client project we have is going to have somebody who's got prime responsibility for working with them. Um, but that person is very rarely in the same physical location as the client. It's still generally always remote. Um, we'll often do kind of on-site visits, maybe at the beginning of the project to kick off, maybe at the end to have a launch party. Um, but mostly it's still always remote. Hi, Tom. Hi, Tom. Hey. I'm Tom from England. <laughs> uh, I was wondering uh, if you feel there are any disadvantages in terms of communication when it comes to uh, remote workers versus someone sitting on a desk opposite you. Yeah, so there, there are, but I think that those disadvantages, like it's more difficult to communicate when you're not talking to someone in person. But in some ways, I think that having that, like, readily available ability to talk to anybody at any point actually makes in-person communication quite lazy often. And so the, the, the kind of constraints that are put on you when you're a distributed company force you to get really good at communicating, which actually the net effect is you're much better at it um, because you've got to think about it because it's just not going to work. Otherwise, like you, you wouldn't be able to be as lazy about the communication if, when, you're just, when you're distributed. So I, yeah, I, and I think that's true of a lot of the a lot of the different aspects to a distributed company. That it puts some constraints on you, and you're forced to overcome them, and then now you're stronger. Hi, Tom. Hey. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, I think you mentioned a lot of the advantages of this kind of model, but yeah. I think it would be useful to also include some of the downsides of or, or challenges of the model itself. Sure. So one of the particular questions I have is uh, how to, how do you, do you hire junior people and how to integrate them with this model? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so I guess our experience hasn't been um, with, with, with kind of too many junior hires, no. And I think that, that, is a, that is kind of a, like not just distribute, but this kind of like no managers model as well. Um, which, which, you know, they sometimes go hand in hand, can mean that mentorship and things are perhaps not as strong as they would be in a very hierarchical um, 
company where everyone's in the same office. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why you can't have those same mentorship um, kind of systems in place and have like buddying and all of that kind of stuff. Um, another really nice side effect of being distributed um, when you can't just communicate freely with each other and you maybe are working with someone who's asleep while you're, you're awake is that you have to document everything. Um, and so actually then as a junior coming in or even as a new person coming in, like most of the work is documented really nicely. Um, so I think there's some, some disadvantages and some advantages there, yeah. Cool, right here in the front. Hi, Siobhan. Uh, sorry? Oh. oh. Hi. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> hi, Tom. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, you said about that you measure just quality rather than the um, number of hours people spend. What metrics do you use to measure the quality of people's work? So mostly, mostly kind of qualitative, I suppose, rather than quantitative. Um, like we're not looking at lines of code written or number of unit test failures or whatever. Um, you, you, you just kind of mostly get a pretty good sense, I guess. Like the most, the most quantitative thing we do is everybody every week posts an update, like a little mini blog post about what they've done, been doing. Um, and so it's pretty easy to get a sense from those over kind of a longer arc of time, um, you know, who's being productive and who isn't. Um, and you know, that, that's then an opportunity to go and address that, I suppose. Right in the front. Hi, uh, Pierre from France. Uh, you underline the autonomy of people in terms of uh, when and uh, where they can work. Uh, in terms of uh, the tools and services uh, you all have to use, uh, how do you get to choose and have people adopt these kind of uh, common tools? Mm. Yeah, so there's definitely, there's definitely a challenge there, right? Because I guess autonomy, the, the purest ideal might be that everybody just does whatever they want all the time, which is kind of chaotic. Um, and, 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 and we are kind of chaotic. Um, but I guess what naturally happens is the best ideas win out. And so we're always like open to new tools, and that means there's some chaos at the edges as people are trying things out new. Um, but over time, what happens is you all kind of arrive at the things that are working best. Um, and, and especially, you know, people who've been here longer have, and have got a bit more experience with those tools, you know, that they're able to kind of sell them quite well to the new people, I suppose. Um, but yeah, it's quite kind of meritocratic, I guess, in that sense. Like, it's just the whatever's best. Cool. Siobhan? Hello. My name's Siobhan. I'm from Ireland. Um, I have a question about, um, about communication as well. I was wondering how you, um, how you can tell if one of your employees is struggling, perhaps, like, emotionally or being stressed out or feeling burned out whenever you don't have that face-to-face -face communication with them. Because mm. when you're typing... Um, it's much easier to hide how you're really feeling. And I was just wondering if you'd had challenges like that and how you would address them. Yeah, I mean, that is a really big challenge with, with, with you know, when you can't see the bags under someone's eyes and, or you can't see the, 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 the dead look in their face, right, when you get into the office, um, it, you can miss that stuff for sure. Um, and also there can be a tendency to, maybe, you know, maybe, they, maybe embellish the work they're doing or hide the fact that they're, 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 they're struggling. Um, it really comes down to, like, something I do is I try and have a one-to-one -one conversation with everybody every month. Um, and I use that to find out how they're doing, chat about life, you know, not about work. Um, it really, like, you've just got to keep talking to everybody all the time, checking in, making sure everyone's okay. Um, and, and having a kind of honest and open culture where it's okay to share that things aren't okay, I suppose. Cool. Uh, hi, Tom. Ned from GoDaddy. Cool. Um, we're a partly distributed team, um, but we're building a product. We're not an agency. Hmm. Um, I'm curious, have you ever had any, uh, and so we have some challenges convincing people internally that remote and distributed is a good thing. Do you ever have a, uh, clients who don't want to work with you because of the structure of the company? Hmm. I don't know whether we've had any that like have just been flound, no. But it's, we've definitely had companies who were really unsure about what that meant. Especially because it's like trying to explain the difference between like offshoring and being distributed it can sometimes be a challenge. Um, I guess that you know mostly we're able to sell the benefits to them of us being spread across lots of time zones and probably we've got people near them and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but maybe that's not so relevant to you guys. Um, I, often it, it comes down to like us getting a foot in the door 
doing a couple of weeks of work and then being like, wow, I'm working with all these like really motivated people. That's awesome. And then as soon as that's gone, you know, as soon as that's out of the way, uh, they don't care. They don't care whether you're distributed or not, as long as you're doing good work. None of that matters actually. Um, but it can be a challenge, kind of getting past that initial. Let us just prove it's fine, for sure. Yeah. Great. We're on the last question. Hi, Tom. I'm Laurent from the very small Luxembourg. Cool. And I was wondering, um, how do you manage payments and contracts with the, your remote teams? Because yeah. you can have them as an employee status, and do you pay them by contract on monthly? Salary? Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so that's that's like pretty challenging. Um, it's really frustrating. Like you know, running distributed companies seems so normal to a, to a lot of us, right? And yeah, it's not at all normal in the wider world. And so our legal systems and things are just not set up for it at all. Um, so we've, we've set up companies in like several of the countries that we employ people in and have uh, clients in. Um, that's generally only worth doing once you've got a critical mass of people, like, I don't know, three or four, because it costs a bit of money and there's like administrative overhead. Um, but also, if you're, if you're employing people in a, or you've got contractors in a country and you're making money in that country as a client, with, you know, say on client projects or from a, from, from a, a, a service or something, um, there can be like tax complications with, you know, that, that country's going to want some of that tax revenue. Um, so yeah, like we've got companies in some other countries that we can use to directly employ people, um, but still a fairly large part of the company technically has to be a contractor just because there's no way around it, unfortunately, at the moment. Yeah, so we treat them exactly as if they were employees. Um, yeah, except for the piece of paper says contract and not employee. Yeah. Cool. Well, that wraps it up. A lot of good questions there. Cool. Um, next talk is at 20 past, so that's in about 10 minutes. Uh, be sure you're back on time. And thank you again, Tom. Thanks. You want your laptop?